This Boss Rush Spotlight is brought to you by, well, you. If you want to learn how to support the Boss Rush family of podcasts, head to BossRush.net or our Patreon at patreon.com slash BossRushMedia. Thanks for helping us build something better. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Boss Rush Podcast Spotlight, where we focus on our favorite developers and creators. I am your host, Corey Deergan. Alongside me for this ride is none other than the PC Muscle Race himself, Laron Dawkins. Hey, what's poppin'? Laron, wearing that pink shirt again, I see. Oh, man. You know me. I, I got to rock the pink. I know. <laughs> I got to rock it. I know. I'm wearing my, you know, third black t-shirt of the week, so, you know. <laughs> on top of a white t-shirt. I, I am, yes. <laughs> yeah. You know, <laughs> you see that outline. <laughs> I know it. It's a thing. It's I. I got to this point where like there. So I. I just gotta. I just gotta clean out my closet, man. There's, there's just so many things in that closet that you know. From, I mean, I still have shirts from like 20 years ago from like midnight launches, and I have like I have the Halo Three midnight launch shirt folded in my closet, and the oh, Mass man. Effect Two shirt, and like I. I just gotta clean it out, man. I just gotta clean I, it out. You know, I have a I have a shirt that's um that I think I want to say it's about twenty years old as well. Um, still in good condition, still still been wearing it and stuff like that. But um, but but I noticed that um because back in the day I used to use like like stick deodorant. It would now I use like the the spray on type, right? Mm-hmm. And uh and it doesn't have the canary yellow stain on it, but it does have that that gray discoloration stain. That's so you know, gross, man. <laughs> and, and and now they're sort of like, man, I love this shirt to death. Like this shirt has been, uh, this is like one of the oldest shirts I have. That's still in very good condition. And I think I'm gonna have to turn it into a muscle shirt. I, I think oh, I'm gonna have boy. to. Hmm. Man. All right. Well, people didn't tune into this episode to hear about our, our shirts and how stained they are because they're old. No, they did they, not. <laughs> they tuned in because they probably saw the title of the episode. Uh, and our Laurent, we have an incredible guest here tonight. Uh, he, he really needs no introduction, really, if you're into, you know, games or RPGs in general. Right. But we have uh the the ceo and founder of something wicked games jeff gardner is here hello jeff welcome to the show thank you so much for uh, having me on i really really appreciate it no oh, thank thank you for you know always coming on and... when people talk about me oh, my <laughs> man i i mean well i'm just as befuddled by my fortuitous circumstances as everyone else <laughs> <laughs> i'm gonna try my best not to make you blush all night long oh, i'm gonna try fine. my best <laughs> i'm gonna i'm gonna try my best not to like freak out because i'm i'm a huge fan of just i mean your resume right i mean producers on elder scrolls fallout uh you know now you're working on another uh what i am based on your pedigree and the team you put together a choice based western rpg and i mean weird song we're gonna get to that right because that's that's the game you're working on now with with uh something wicked games and but you are just Man, you're the man. You're the I th- I think you're the reason I own an Xbox 360. At least, you know, at least 50% of the reason why I own one. So, uh it, for people who don't know, tell us who you are, you know, kind of a little bit where you came from, the elevator pitch of, you know, your development history. Yep. Um again, thank you so much for the introduction. It's it's nice to meet both of you. Um so I um I'm a a, a tried and true geek. <laughs> Through and through, I started on Dungeons and Dragons in the uh, early '80s, uh, just like the kids in Stranger Things. I watched it with my daughter and told her that was your dad, um, <laughs> and sort of got a creative writing arts degree. Ended up in Los Angeles to be a writer. Um, went back to school, got a degree in tech, and sort of found myself. I was working at um, Vans, the sneaker company, on their website. And then I met a guy at a party <laughs> who made video games, and I talked his ear off for two hours, cornered him. Um, it's it's something that uh, people still do people do to me now, and I and I, I appreciate it. This guy gave me an opportunity to be. I became a designer. I had a little studio called Seven Studios in Los Angeles. They're now they're they're now defunct. I um, did a remake of Defender, was my very first game, early two thousands. Then I became lead designer on Fantastic Four, which was a movie tie in around two thousand five. Um, 
and actually got to play that game with Stan Lee, which was sort of amazing. I didn't even really realize how cool that was. At the time. Oh my gosh, that's yeah. incredible! First game oh ever, God. ever, ever. Oh, first time he ever held a controller was with me. And oh, wow. honestly, my design director Charles Staples. So I'll tell you about something with games in a minute. The design director of Something Weird Games is my longtime twenty-year friend Charles Staples, who worked on that game with me. Anyway, and my business partner is the guy who got me my first job, Mark Morris. Anyway, I saw Todd Howard pitch Oblivion at E3, and I was like, I will do anything to work on this game at all. And so I did. I took a 35% pay cut. I went from a design director to a producer, moved 2,500 miles um, with my uh, 15-month-old daughter and my eight-month pregnant now ex-wife, and um, worked on Oblivion and worked at a Bethesda for 15 years. So I start, I, my career trajectory there was I started as producer on Oblivion. And with my um, design knowledge, it put me, um, I produced the design department. That was my major job. So I produced the design department for the Fallout 3 and Skyrim, and then became lead producer on Fallout 4, then project lead on Set Fallout 76, which is an odd title for the video games industry, but it's actually the title that Todd Howard had on Morrowind that he gave to me um, for 76. I can tell you a lot of stories about 76, super difficult, ultimately one of my most proud, my most proud accomplishments because we actually did, we, the Zenimax gave us the, the time to turn it around. Um, mm -hmm. And then after COVID um, left and started um, about six months after I took some time to breathe because those are a lot of games. Right. <laughs> Right. I uh, mm -hmm. something wicked games. So that that's like the quick pitch of my my career history there. It's it's funny. And I, I know you said you know Fallout fall seventy six uh, was was a challenge. My the Destiny podcast that I have, we actually have a whole section of that Discord dedicated to seven Fallout seventy six fans. Uh, you know, and and I've I've always been like meaning to jump in, but like I ha I already have like. <laughs> pretty much two games as a service right now and and you know i i i kind of like the solo fallout experience to be honest but i no, i'm fine. i have it i have downloaded i actually downloaded it uh, about a month ago this is my friend my one friend uh bruce is really into it he's like just run through it for, with me i'm like all right all right we'll do it we'll we'll make some time we'll do it uh and then i got sucked yeah. back into destiny because it's Destiny. a fun run, and I think the people keep playing that game because of the building mechanics. I was really, mm -hmm. really proud of the building um, and how we supported that over time. We don't need to talk about it too long, but I really – that um, 76 was a <laughs> – you know, we had three years to put that out, and we got it out, um, and we spent the next year and a half sort of flailing, trying to fix it, and finally Wastelanders and subsequent DLC really, really patched it up. And super proud of that game and that team. Yeah. I mean, it's a – I mean, I mean, any game as a service is is hard to launch. I think, right? I mean, Destiny saw it. Uh, the Division One saw it. You know, uh, um, Anthem. I mean, look at Anthem, oh, yeah. right? I mean, Grand Theft uh, Auto, the yeah. uh, multiplayer, all of them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Almost all yeah. Of them so, yeah. so anybody who's trying to launch a game as a service, I'm like, you know what? That's I, I, I respect, I respect the hell out of that because it's, uh, it's a, that's a tough job to make sure it launches right and make sure you have your content roadmap and so much yeah, yeah. i learned a lot it was it was a great it was a great learning experience yeah so uh as most painful things are <laughs> <laughs> yeah true uh yeah uh so i i want to go i want to go back because my my first actually kind of realm in the in the i guess western rpg is what they're calling them now wrpgs what yeah. was was morrowind and you know i I mean, I was like, I was a Dreamcast kid, so I was playing all these arcade games and, you know, Genesis. I mean, I'm, you can only play Fantasy Star for so long. So, like, I wasn't really that familiar with this type of RPG. You know, my my PC gaming roots were like, you know, Marathon and Roller Coaster Tycoon, right? Those were like the games that I played. Uh, so I didn't really have a lot of uh, a lot of of you know, experience with those types of games. And so I played Morrowind. I, I liked it. I didn't, I didn't love it, but I think it's because I didn't really understand it. But like when the Xbox 360 came out and I remember OXM had oblivion on the cover and I was like, this game looks awesome. And then gears came out and my friends were playing gears. And when I was in college, like my, my, friends they were twins and they each had an xbox 360 and one of them was playing gears and one of them was playing oblivion and i'm like i gotta i gotta have these games you know 
and and so I ended up having both those games and in the Burger King games, like we were kind of talking before we started recording. The yeah. the only games I had until Halo Three came out <laughs> were Gears of War and Oblivion and the dumb Burger King games because they were four dollars a piece. So God, I remember those. That's a funny callback. Yeah. 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 Man. Good thing you didn't put the the king in oblivion. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that would have been fantastic. Oh my god, uh, man! So, what was what was it? What was it like working on your first project at Bethesda? You know, you said you took the pay cut and moved all the way across the country to do this. Like, what was it? What was it like for you, kind of stepping in there and kind of realizing <laughs> where you were at at the time? Um. You know, it, it, oof, be, I have some funny stories, but they might not go over well. With some people still work there. Um, <laughs> well, when I started working there, it was oh, whatever. Um, it's true, and it, there's no harm. So when I started working, uh, the, enti- the entire Zenimax organization was 75 people. BGS was about 50 of those, right? When Zenimax sold to Microsoft, they were around 2,007 or 2,800 to give you some Mm-hmm. Some perspective. There's like 25 support publishers, p- publishing individuals, and the rest of us on BGS um, Studio as a whole. Um, and I got in a cubicle, and I was sitting in a cubicle, and the, my, the, the, I was on the end, and the person next to me was Emil Pagliarulo, who is the design director and the lead writer for all these games, that are, all the Fallout games that have come out um, in Starfield. And he's he's my I, you know, he's my best friend for honestly, he is still talk to him all the time. And uh, Emma and I are definitely thick as thieves. But anyways, um, <laughs> it's one day I was working and I felt drips on my head and it started pouring water on me. <laughs> and they were like, yeah, that's why we set you in that cube <laughs> because, because water <laughs> comes in and it rains. So anyways, that was with those early days. It had no locks on the doors. There was an old sneaker factory where they'd ship sneakers out. The building was mixed with an insurance company and something oh, else. Like it was very, very, wow. like, very rustic, right? Like we're 50 people um, that shipped to Bolivian. There was about 70 on Fallout 3. There was 100 people on Skyrim. Like Bethesda was a very small sort of scrappy studio for a very long time. Um, so anyways, the, the, and then, you know, you, you just, but the advantage of being in these small scrappy studios is you get, if you're, you know, it's not even ambitious. If you're, if you're willing to just try things and fail and sort of have fun and, and get in the mix, you can really affect games. You can go in and do a lot of stuff. And because this, because the, the studio I was at prior, the, the first game I ever worked on had 15 folks full out fan. Oh, sorry. Um, Fantastic Four hit about 30 and then Oblivion about 50. So you, I got very used to going in and doing whatever, whatever could I could to help. Like my, 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 sort of MO throughout all of my career is how can I be of service? That's what I always try to ask myself. Like, how can I help? I, you know, if when I find, and I'm not perfect at this, there are times I make it about me and there's times I'm looking for things. I'm not saying I'm not, but generally if I, my default position is how can it be of service? And it's an, you, it, once you have that mindset, it's amazing the opportunities that open up to you and the things you can do in a game. So I sat down, started playing Oblivion and, and, I was, barely, you know, I was very new. I had never produced. I had no idea what production was like. I had been on the receiving end of production, which people on the receiving end of production are never very happy with producers, right? So I started playing the game and making tons of notes. And lo and behold, they were they were fixing all the things I was telling them they should fix, right? And so that's when I think that they didn't really know where I was going to fit in. That's when I really think that they, they put me in the design department. And I, you know, I worked on, um, and Fallout 3 was amazing. A lot of people still cite that it's like one of their favorite games out of, Bethesda and, and we like remember that's our first game we had gunplay it's the first time like the the combat in Oblivion was literally a, a ray cast that basically randomly decided if you hit something or not it was there was no actual physics to it and so Fallout 3 was amazing because we got to again like just how can I help what can we do and you know it anyways that's been sort of my MO at Bethesda and now with my new studio too like I, I just want to be of service and help the people around me succeed because, you know, we all share in that success. Right. And, and, and I think that's sort of the, the, the magic sauce that one would really need to be successful in this industry because it, it can get really hard. <laughs> there's yeah. a lot of hours and there's a lot of hard decisions. And oftentimes there's not good decisions. You have to choose between the two least, I call them the least bad decision. That's a lot of uh, the least bad. Yeah. What's the least bad decision today. And in, in, in listen, because you, you're faced with these design conundrums constantly, production conundrums constantly, like we can't do everything. What are we going to cut? What are we going to you know not do? 
full tilt. I don't want to see half ass, but what are we going to like not put as much attention on? And it's a constant sort of, you have to really hone your gut and your instincts. And the more you are of service to other people, the more they'll help you and, and then you'll succeed. So anyways, sorry to get philosophical on you. Oh no, <laughs> no, oh, no, 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 no. Yeah. Yeah. D digging it. Yeah. It's uh, that's like, that's like, I mean, that's a great philosophy to have, I think, especially from someone who's, I mean, now you're, you're running a studio and the fact that you're, you know, not in, in the ivory tower looking down on the, on the, you know, developers working away while you're up, you know, sipping the bubbly and, and, you know, <laughs> yeah. you know, uh, I think, I think that's really a great philosophy. I, I, I'm fortunate enough to work in a place right now too, where, uh, my boss is like that. And, uh, you know, I mean, not that it's like game design or anything, but, you know, we we have a we have a place where he's always willing to help. And I kind of am taken on a lot because I'm always willing to help. Right. And it's kind of that's a, that's a good philosophy. I really like that uh, about that. So and I, I'm sure that helped you kind of move up too, right. I mean, if you're willing to do more. I, I'm sure people see that. Yeah, I, in fairness, you know, I am. I, I'm not going to pretend like I'm not an ambitious person, um, but I, I try to really. It's funny because there's a new there's a term I've heard recently called servant leadership, and mm -hmm. that definitely has been my philosophy the whole time. Like, in in listen again, like I'm not perfect at that. Like I I definitely have have made my my fair share of mistakes along the way, but um, but you know you sort of you make amends to the people you harm and you, you keep trying to do better every day is an attempt to do better. So that's how I've done it. And it's been great. And I, like I've been blessed. The things I've learned, I've been blessed to bring with me to something wicked games. And that's why we have 37 in a less than a year. We have 37 people now, which is, is really shockingly fast growth, especially in the first um, year last year was very hard to find people. There was still, right. there was still uh, good game devs were very hard to come by. And so we were really lucky to have attracted some of the amazing talent we have so far. Yeah. Well, I mean, I was, when I was looking at your website, you found some good ones. You know? you. I mean, I mean, I, I'm just, uh, I mean, the games that, that you, that people have worked on that you've brought in, you know, like I, I really enjoyed the outer worlds. I really like, I really like Bioware games going all the way back to like, you know, Baldur's Gate. And then, uh, you know, Knights of the Republic was like my real kind of meaty, uh, Bioware game and Jade Empire. And obviously, you know, moving on to mass effect and dragon age, but like the people that you've brought in, it's just incredible. Like how, how do you, how did you lure these people away from, you know? Well, you know, the, my co-founders, uh, Charles Staple and Akram Rashad have really good reputations in industry as well. Um, so Charles Staples, when I, I mentioned that Charlie, we call him Charlie when he, when he, him and I worked together, I met him on Fantastic Four in Los Angeles, and, and, and ostensibly I went to Bethesda, and he very almost in the same trajectory went to Obsidian. So he was at Obsidian for 15 years. He's a lead level designer of Fallout New Vegas. He then went on, he did South Park, a, a mm -hmm. bunch of games there, and ultimately was the design director on the Outer Worlds, and he was co-credited on the Navigator Award with Leonard Bayarsky and Tim Kaine, the founding fathers of Fallout. It's it, it's uh, it's a super high honor and. Um, and he deserves it. He's amazing. And Ekram as well had worked on Fallout Shelter, Fallout 76. He comes from Behavior Interactive. He's up in Montreal and has a great reputation up there. I was one of the few people in Montreal I, I've met in game development that hasn't worked at Ubisoft. <laughs> so anyways, <laughs> side joke. Um, but, you know, and so so when we, so in August, we had founded the, the company. Um, we basically, I started in April of 2021, or sorry, 2022. My founder started in June. And then in August, we made the crazy decision to go on opening night live um, with Jeff Keeley and put that weird song trailer up, which you can see on YouTube still. Um, and it, it was a decision because listen, these are big games and it's not, this game is not coming out tomorrow. <laughs> um, but we did it because I wanted to sort of plant our flag in what we were making and I wanted to attract industry talent and it, it worked. I mean, there's something very lucky. Again, I, I, I try to be always grateful about these things, but very lucky that that trailer spoke to a lot of game devs and that's really what they all cite. And then they, they listen to some of the podcasts I do like this and some of the interviews I've done where I'm talking about, you know, unreliable narrator, narrator, how we're, um, you know, we're, we're, we're doing a Western RPG, but we're looking at elements of it and trying to, to basically polish areas I think need polish 
and really hone in on what makes them special, which are to me, the sim nature of the AI that Bethesda games are famous for, frankly, and the story. And we really, in, in Obsidian is huge on gray, gray, you know, not black and white narratives, gray narratives, and a lot of choice and consequence. And I really think that the two of those together are, are the peanut butter and chocolate. Um, and we're leaning into it like really, really hard. Um, we're, I, I, I'm super excited about this project and I'm even more so now than when I started it. Um, when I went, when I, when I went to Bethesda back in 2005, after I saw Todd pitch oblivion, I had this feeling in my gut that that game was going to be amazing. I had to be a part of it. And it was a good, it was a good call. Yeah, <laughs> difficult, clearly, difficult clearly, call. Yeah. Difficult call. Yes. And I have the same, for whatever you agree with me, I have the exact same feeling now about this game, even stronger. Um, I look for like there's the synchronicities and the serendipities and these little things that sort of come together, the happy accidents. And when you start seeing those lining up, you, I sort of feel like I'm the right path. If that makes sense, I, it's a, again, sorry to get philosophical, but I, sometimes you just don't know what the right decision is and you have to go with the coincidences and the synchronicities. So I am, and this game in this project has been full of it and I'm so grateful and, and I, I cannot wait to release and show more. Uh, we actually just finished our beautiful corner, so I have an amazing video in game of gameplay. <laughs> Show it to anybody. It's oh, not, man. not ready for consumption yet. I just don't listen. When you're far out, you don't want to. You don't. There's so many things can change between now and shipping, and you have to really time those things correctly. But we are a mm -hmm. smaller studio, I'll tell you that. So I will be building the hype train for a little longer than uh, the Bethesda way, which was like, hey, say something six months before it launches, and and watch yeah. people lock in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, so I mean. Plus more, Sorry, I want to involve the community too. I'm really excited about involving people in the community and getting their feedback on this game early days. That's something I really learned on 76 is how valuable that is and how that can actually support your prod, prod, your game. Mm -hmm. I don't like saying the P word. I don't like calling them product. It's hard. Everyone does. So mm -hmm. how do you support your game and yeah. um, you know get feedback from the actual people who are going to play it and spend hundreds, if not thousands of hours playing it? So anyway, that's my yeah. pitch. I, uh, I mean, but I mean, this is something that you're creating like from, from the ground up for your studio like you i mean you you have founders and everything but like this is this is your studio and this game is your first game and you're you're excited like i know that excitement from just starting this a couple years ago after being a part of you know two things that were you know kind of bigger but you know then starting my own thing and then it is what it is now and like i couldn't be prouder to tell people about it all the time like it's a joke at work like oh you do podcasts? You have podcasts? You, you know, like <laughs> I, I'm like, I'm like, yeah. Um, and and then you know, like when we when we brought you know, like Laron came in a little bit later, and then we brought uh, you know just the rest of the people that we work with, and now like I couldn't be prouder of our product. I can't wait to product. See, I did it again. It's hard. So you have to. <laughs> you have to <laughs> look when you're when you're pitching things. Product makes it sound sellable uh, yeah. uh if you want to be a patreon producer head on over to patreon patreon.com slash boss rush media and find out which tier is right for you our patreon producers at the five dollar tier or higher for this month are adriel munger austin campbell celeste roberts christian s sana dirig francisco santilan and rebecca jewel thank you for your continued support But you making a game, that's something I, that's something I, I've always like wanted to do was make a game. And the, and the fact that like, not only do you have this impressive resume, but now you're taking what you learned at Bethesda to make your own thing. And it's really exciting. And the, that, you know, the trailer um, is so cool. My favorite part is when like the, the moon is eclipsing and like the, like when it's and then like the it's sun that, turns around yeah. and it turns into an eye and you just see the dark figure oh, it's so it's so good. yeah i am like yeah it's crazy yeah and so you know what i know a lot of people get mad when people announce their games quote unquote too early but like why not and especially for your first project you got it, and like you said the community is important and you you want to know uh what the community kind of wants and uh, i'll tell you i'll tell you flipping between first and third person is a is a great feature just, <laughs> just throw you to that one um, <laughs> yeah, uh, <laughs> you know, you know I'll, I'll say this as an add-on to what you were saying just now Corey. um i don't mind i don't mind when when like stuff is announced too early you know i uh, you know and 
as long as it's not something like the like nine nine million miles away, like what Cyberpunk was when it first when it first uh, announced, you know, way back. And I'm not talking about back when we saw like that that 19 minute like footage thing, you know. Oh, yeah, I, was, I saw that live at E3. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh man. <laughs> but yeah, no, because I like I like knowing what studios are doing, you know. Um, and but you know. You get kind of you get kind of into muck though when you do what Bioware tends to do with uh, with, with what they tend to do with Mass Effect with Andromeda particularly and stuff like that. It was like it was like man, you hit us over the head with so much stuff that we that we began to worry about the game, and then you know mm-hmm. stuff happened. <laughs> yeah, I also I also think the exact t- uh, that's exact argument I would make. Like there's a there's a time. Listen, it depends. Your timing for announcing a game depends on the the studio in your in your marketing capabilities right like again i'm a smaller studio i'm very small like compared to the the, the studios you just mentioned i'm a i'm a blip on the radar so mm-hmm. i need to make a lot of noise where they can make very little noise but they're huge studios and anything mm-hmm. they they put out they put out a logo and people go crazy right like mm-hmm. yeah so like I, it, and we need to do more and like i said i needed to do more for to to for folks in the industry right like in in, in what and now that we've we've really got the ground floor of the studio really built out and we continue to grow. I'll be able to. We'll be able to release more because we, we've done so much in the last year. I mean, we have really. Again, we have a lot of professional people who work really fast, and mm-hmm. we're looking for the smart, scrappy individuals who are self motivated. And we've got a thirty seven of them, and they're just every day is a new adventure and amazingness. <laughs> Honestly, yeah. it's, uh, our our art Slack channel is amazing. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, that's as is our narrative. Frankly, too, we've done a ton of writing. A ton, yeah. A ton of yeah. Yeah. So the uh, the uh, Gamescom interview you did with IGN, you you said you didn't really have like a quite the the plan yet, but you knew what you kind of want were aiming for. Have you have you kind of focused that in? Do you know what you're doing with that now? Not yeah, like we have we have the ahead. full scope and schedule of the project. Um, we uh, another area that obviously near and dear to my heart is to making sure that all this stuff fits in the bag we're given. And, you know, we've, um, our, our production director, um, was also, she worked on following Vegas as well, Tess Taplin. And now, and she actually, when we got her, she was at Respawn. So she's super professional and, um, in, 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 in very, very intelligent and, and able to help devs again, find the best way to do things in a, in a holistic and smart way. Anyway. Yeah. We, we have the, the original seed vision of the game is now very fleshed out. It's still mostly paper dock land. Mm-hmm. We are building a lot of tech behind the scenes. Unreal does something super well and some things it doesn't do um, just because they make unreal engine really for Fortnite. And so you sort of anything else on top of that, you sort of have to either modify or add on. So we've done a lot of that initial groundwork as well. And like I said, we don't, the industry we call it the beautiful corner, which normally is like a room or two where you're sort of in maybe a landscape where you're sort of like looking around and we did a full run through with, we've got a lot of gameplay in already. Um, and so, yeah, we are well on our way to getting kicking off the ground. Now we're working on something called first playable. So we'll actually make it much more hands-on so you can actually start tuning the mechanics of the game, making sure that the character control and camera are all the three C's, which is everyone will say are very solid as well as some of the gameplay on that you're familiar with questing and conversations, um, itemization, all the, the things, the paper doll aspects of the character. We're doing all that. We're working very heavily on the AI too, because that's a big part of games. I think the biggest differentiator between like a, Bethesda open world game and a um, other open world games is oftentimes to me it's the it's the AI and the sim nature of the game. So we are going to replicate that as best as possible and, ma- and make our own decisions there. But um, and we're well on our way. That, that that's we are we're definitely we're we're, we're fully like we are actually slowing down hiring right now to make sure we have the right people focused on the right stuff. Because hiring is a big distraction. Oh man! <laughs> a lot of time. Oh, man. I got so I can I can go on and on. <laughs> I mean, I'm not going to stop. Because I'm, I'm so used. Yeah. I'm going to admit to something. I'm so used to like someone's going to yell at me. Someone's going to tell me I talk, talk, talk too much. I was like, wait a minute, no, I, I'm, the, I'm the CEO. I can <laughs> say what I want. <laughs> no, no one in Bethesda marketing is going to tap me on the shoulder saying, "Going like this, stop, stop talking." <laughs> I mean, yeah, that'd be funny if like Pete Hines just knocked <laughs> on your door and was like, "Yeah, shut up." <laughs> shut shut up. up. <laughs> I'm a very good friend with Pete. He's uh, I had a big, big milestone birthday this summer, and he's uh, he he he's coming. So that's great. That's awesome. 
Yeah, I'm that's sorry. very up man. Not all the folks up at Bethesda still. I, I I miss that studio quite a bit. It was a very hard decision to to depart there. Um, yeah. I, it was the right decision for me, but it was a very difficult decision. I put a lot of sweat equity and 15 years of blood, sweat, and tears into that place. Yeah, I mean that that's always hard when you're somewhere for such a long time. We were, yeah. uh, well, at the time of this recording yesterday, we were talking to uh, way forward and their game directors have been there for 15 and 19 years respectively. And, you know, mm -hmm. they, they said that, you know, longevity is kind of like why they feel like they're the quality is there, you know, and uh, no, I would hundred percent agree that having a team work on something over and over again is a really big secret to success. Mm -hmm. Um, because you start to, because shipping games is not only about technical ability, it's a lot about personality too. Mm -hmm. And so um, I, I, I saw Steven Spielberg do a talk once after this, he did this movie, I don't know if I remember, it's called AI years ago. Mm -hmm. And he spoke and he talked about how he uses the same composer, the same director of photography, all the same people on most of his movies, because it just, it makes for a, a smoother experience and you know what you're going to get from them. Right. And so I thought it was very insightful. Um, and that's what I, I've always felt that way about the Bethesda too. There are people there that have been there over 25. I think one person is like almost 30 years from like really old days. Like some of them come from arena. Right. So yeah, they're still there. man, that's, that's a long time. So, I mean, if this is, if this <laughs> time is, to retire. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, I mean, I don't know if you really want to answer this question and you don't have to, if you don't want to, but I mean, what, what was the decision to leave? Just, you wanted to start something new. You wanted to, you know, kind of. It's a combination of factors. So COVID gives you a lot of time to reflect, right? It's so like, so in, in COVID, so I always had this dream of my retirement and no surprise to anybody. Uh, it was playing a lot of games, right? And in COVID, oh boy, I had untold, unfettered hours and hours of gameplay. And, and for me, listen, I, I still play a ton of games. I was mentioning before this, I had to get sucked. You guys pulled me away from Diablo 4. <laughs> um, but there was something where I just, I knew I did, that was not a great idea. Not that I was ready to retire, but I was like, this is not, I, I, I want to keep working, but I want to keep working. I want to, I, I have ideas for games and I, and I want to create, you know, one of the ideas was create a baby. So what I, so COVID gave me a lot of time to reflect um, the Microsoft acquisition was, I thought was a good time to go. I had 15 years there. I had done, I got a sabbatical. I took a month off and I was like, now it's time to go. So I talked to Todd and I departed. And then I, I did, I, I was looking for a number of things in the first uh, four to six months. One was to do this, start a studio. Um, I interviewed at some very, for some very high level positions at other game studios. And I also considered consulting, um, and ultimately, I was sort of pushing on all three. This was always the one I was really hoping would get off the ground. And I put a pitch deck together. Um, I, I think I had I was on the 30th iteration on my deck before I went live with it, believe it or not. I found a concept artist, which was one of the hardest things in COVID. Um, I, I got this, this gentleman. His name's Chris Cold. He's amazing. He, his art is what you see in the trailer. Mm -hmm. And he still works with us. He was like employee number one. And um, him and he gave me the concept art and we we pitched it and, and got funding and it was sort of the, the rocket ship took off from there. And it's, in hindsight, it's been the best. It was really the best decision I ever made. But I was fortunate enough to have, you know, a cushion financially right. experience in the industry, both as a creative and as a bean counter producer. Mm -hmm. um, and, and again, like good relationships with people that were willing to jump ship and come with me from various studios across the across the globe really yeah. um and it was a combination of those things that have made this reality yeah i uh i i always wonder like especially like when the microsoft acquisition happened like how many people were like well it's microsoft they're you know this big corporate entity coming in and then i mean i know like xbox tries to treat themselves different and i'm as as the Xbox guy on this team, you know, I, 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 I look forward to the direction that they're moving, but you know, I, I feel like that would have been the time where most people would have made that decision of I'm going to stay and work on these games or I'm going to go and do my own thing. And, uh, I'm, I'm <laughs> kind of glad you did that because this is, I mean, this weird, weird song is, uh, you want to tell us a little bit about weird song? I don't, I don't want to like repeat what, <laughs> what I heard on, on the, in the interview, but I want you to kind of talk about sure, it because it's, sure. it's the concept is so cool. I was telling my wife about it. She's like, Whoa, that sounds cool. And she doesn't even, 
you don't play games. She's like, what? <laughs> <laughs> so Weird Song is, is a real love child. And, you know, in, again, in COVID, as I started this, one of my big partners doing this has been my wife, Jessica. And so her and I talked a lot about um, the, the, the what to do. And she actually helped me quite a bit. Uh, both creatively and convincing me, um, one, to do this venture, by the way, she's my biggest believer, and two, um, what the game shape was going to take. So she's got a lot of really neat ideas. She plays a lot of role-playing games, and particularly uh, our games. So she's a big fan of Don't Starve and Valheim Builders, too. And so we talked about it, and I, you know, I had done, po- I was in Fallout for 10 straight years. So it's like, it cannot be post-apocalyptic. I cannot do another minute in there. Yeah. Uh, maybe maybe the next game a few years from now. But right now, I was like, and I am a big fantasy nerd. I play a lot of Warhammer fantasy and Dungeons and Dragons. So I was like, I want to do it. But in fairness, fantasy is is it's it's there's a few fantasy games out there. It's been done over and over again. So I didn't really want to do another token esque fantasy, right? And right. Sort, sort of more generic. I think that. This and there's a familiarity there, which is comforting to people like myself that loves them. But it's also sort of a there's a trap as well where you have to differentiate yourself, and in doing so, it's a lot of you mentioned I, I you know about lore and stuff. It's it's the wrong kind of lore though, where you're explaining why you're different, not why you're cool. If that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Anyway, um, she can conv- she helped. We talked about it, and I was you know I was I, I wanted to include a pagan element in some of the some of the standard fantasy stuff, but I wanted to do it more historical, right? And she we had gone to Portugal right before COVID, and it was our in 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 COVID again. Like you remember that last vacation really well because you, again, like you don't you don't know what you have until it's gone. Right. Yeah. And, in, and so we were looking at the pictures, and she was like, "Why didn't you send to Portugal?" And I was like, "Oh my God, yes." Um, and we did, and, and so Weird Song is a, is a, here's the, the pitch is Weird Song is a dark, semi-historical, open world role-playing game set in medieval Portugal, right? And what we're doing with it is, is we're, t- we're, we're, we're taking the, the basis is the Knights Templar and the Knights Templar, every, everyone knows there has been obviously Templar games like Assassin's Creed and stuff, but I still don't think it's been quite. I still don't think justice has quite been done. So I am very big. I call it the war in my head. I am a very big, I very, I like his, history and I like myth history, <laughs> which is, I don't know if that's a real term or not. <laughs> myth history around the Templars, right? But the belief in Baphomet and in all the, all the, 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 the rituals they used to do, which obviously came out from excruciating torture. So are, are these real or not? You don't know. And then there's been a lot of writers, what the, the Templars have existed, like, existed in the zeitgeist of Western Europeans since they, they went away, right? Since um, Jacques de Molay was burned at the stake in front of um, Notre Dame. Mm-hmm. And so, and I think it's because of this myth history and this conspiracy about their treasure, that they had the lost Ark, that where, where's all their, where are the gold come from? How did the, the, how did the Pope and the King of France round up these knights that basically they had more money than the kingdom of France. They were, they were a, a literally like a crazy mercenary army that just, just gave themselves up. So there's a lot of there, there, I think to the conspiracy. Mm-hmm. Um, and anyway, so we're playing that up with this story. Now I do want to be clear. You can, we, there's character creation. You can play anybody, any gender or race you want. We really want to open this. That's why I'm calling it semi-historical. Um, you know, I, I don't want to get into like, this is like some kind of true retelling of, of, of history at all because we're adding fantastical elements, right? There's going to, there's this questionable, you're, you're going to question your sanity and the nature of reality throughout this game. And the more you dig into the storyline, you're going to discover more and more that the Templars are hiding sort of behind their secret rituals and we're making a crazy big open world RPG with three different factions that um, that all play a part of this. And you're going to have to make hard decisions in this game. You're not going to be able to play all the factions. You're going to have to align with one or the other. We're giving you an opportunity to switch and betray a faction. So we're going to do all the, the work because I, to me, the true promise of gaming is these open world RPGs where not only can you sort of play what you want and explore them on your pace, but you can affect the outcome of the story in ways that just a linear game your decisions you can't right so you are you are, you're on a prescribed path in a lot of other games even even ones that are open world right there's a prescribed path for mm-hmm. you and we want to really lay into the dna of obsidian where there is not a prescribed path here we're going to offer a lot and this isn't just going to be like some cards at the end of how your your decisions affect the world we're going to change 
in the nature of the world itself around you based on the decisions you make and the sort of unreliable narrator of the player is going to be. It's a long, that's a long elevator pitch, but there you go. Oh, man. <laughs> it's a, it's a long ride to the top. Uh, I guess, you know, it's uh, true. Uh, true. Uh, so not to go, I know you don't want to give a lot of stuff away for this game because I know a lot of you want people to play it, but what, I mean, what are, besides like the setting and kind of like the, the time period and, and everything, like what are, what are, I guess, what are some gameplay inspirations that you're aiming for? Like, are you aiming for that Skyrim esque feel or are you, are you looking at something like the Witcher or something just completely different that you're hoping will, you know, you know, if, I'll give a crazy high bar. How about a mashup of Skyrim, Witcher, and Elden Ring? <laughs> those are the those okay. Are the so I'll, okay. I'll tell you. So Skyrim had again the sim nature of the game. Right there was there was emergent gameplay and a simulated nature of the game there that was so amazing. So you could go about and one of the things. So I my first two games were very linear. Right there was it was old school game. There was levels you had to load in between and you'd go in and. You know, there, there's no decisions. You sort of, the, 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 you, you get new tools and the, the difficulty gets ramped up. Mm-hmm. Those games are, are I know I'm sorry. They're very difficult to make because you play as, as a design. Anybody on the team will have played them 70, 80, 100 times before they come out. And it's mm-hmm. always the same path through. You're just looking for very minor differences in bugs, frankly. When I started working in Oblivion, I was amazed because I was like, oh, I get to play this game. I can do whatever I want. I can mm-hmm. spend all day like looking for these specific flowers in the west side of the map or i can go into these dungeons or i can do this quest line and so i want to explore that nature of the open world um skyrim bethesda game so the the witcher and obsidian games in particular i thought were very the stories were very good not that the stories in skyrim fall aren't amazing but they really paid a lot of attention to the decisions and details within those stories Mm -hmm. And the Witcher combat, I thought, was also a step up. Um, Not quite level of Elden Ring, but still, like, there was was a lot of... Witcher really refined and polished elements of the open world game in the the proper way. I thought, I've been a Witcher fan since the first one. I am a huge fan of everyone there. Um, I've been lucky to meet a few of them now um, in person. And I couldn't say hi, hi, speak highly enough of CD Projekt Red. Next, Elden Ring... I thought Elden Ring, the exploration and the environmental stories, how Bethesda does a great job with this too, but the exploration in Elden Ring was top notch. So every time you went to a zone or an area, you were discovering things and in, in tools and things you can do in your arsenal that you then took back into other zones. And so my favorite story is I got stuck at one of the bosses and I, and I was like, okay, I guess I need to grind. Right. And I was like, oh, here we go. I'm going to have to just kill monsters over and over again, try to get levels to, to sort of beat this. And when I went back to the zones I had thought I had finished, I realized that I didn't see a quarter of them. Literally some of them I went through four times. and was still discovering new things. Like mm-hmm. just the angle you walk through a forest, you see different things that you couldn't have seen when you go the other direction. Mm-hmm. So anyway, so those are the, the mashup of the, the big, the big, like big, big, um, inspirations for me on this game i uh if i can come halfway to any of them i'll be be happy (laughs) so uh, stephanie has invaded my computer she's usually the one that crashes when she's on (laughs) i'm gonna count us down and i'll kind of reintroduce my thought so three two one yeah, when I when I saw the trailer for the first time, I kind of that my first thought was Elden Ring and like that, not necessarily how difficult it was, but uh, or you know necessarily even the world, but like the combat kind of you know the having a mix of range and maybe melee or even you know some something in between, like that's uh, that's kind of where my mind went and and that's as as much as I'm not like a souls soulsy person. Like I kind of imagined it being a more, almost like a more agile kind of Elden Ring, Dark Souls esque. I, I guess I guess that would be Bloodborne at this point, but uh, you know that's that's kind of where my head went at first. So you kind of comparing it to that, or you know, kind of wanting maybe something close to that is kind of cool. Are you gonna? Oh, go ahead. Sorry. No, the combat more so in Elden Ring, in fairness, the the sense of exploration and the lack of handholding. 
Mm-hmm. This is like the last point I was going to make. And I've read some articles on this that I picked up on it too, because Zelda has a lack of handholding and Elden Ring has a lack of handholding. And I just, I love open world games. And I, I so I, and I dev, never like dissing on other people's games. So I, in, so being vague, I don't like when I get to a zone and have a little checkbox list of things to accomplish in order to feel like I finished mm-hmm. the zone. I like to discover those things. And yeah. if I want to finish the zone, I, yes, I have to go online and look at guides and stuff, but it's more about my my organic sense of progression of the zone because it allows me to revisit them and discover new things. But when I have a checklist of stuff to do, plus I have, I don't know, I've gamer, I call it gamer OCD. So I've just mm-hmm. been trained by 30 years of video games where you want to do everything because when you get to the next zone, if you missed one acorn and you don't have the right number of hearts, and I, Zelda is not guilty of this, but I'm using that as an example, <laughs> you won't be successful in the next zone or it'll be harder for you. Mm-hmm. And so I there's a lot of games I play where I get like three quarters of the way through them And I'm like so burned out because I've done every single little side thing to maximize my power in the game. And Mm -hmm. in Elden Ring, you don't, you, 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 you don't know until you get your ass kicked and then you go back and you, it's a joyful discovery instead of a Mm -hmm. sort of like a a drudgery or like a, like a, like a chores. It feels like chores to me. I'm like, Oh, I get to do my video game chores tonight. And that is not something I don't (laughs) think any designer wants a player to feel (laughs) like my game is a list of chores. (laughs) Yeah, I, I mean, I, not to like, like you, not to like call anybody out, but I know exactly what games you're talking about. And I used to think that I really liked those games and I put a lot of time into those games to be fair, but like, man, now that I, I think, I think games like, you know, Fallout and, and even going into something like Zelda now really changed my opinion on the way that open world games work. And if I want something that's, you know, kind of, you know, linear, I guess I'll find a game that's kind of linear. I'm not going to, I'm not going to waste this giant, beautiful world, right. To do something that's linear. I'm going to, you know, it's, it's, it, it's kind of crazy how like Zelda and Zelda used to be that way. Right. Where like it, you, you, they gave you kind of this semi, I, you know, kind of hub world, like hub worlds, I guess to go yeah. explore, but you still had to follow the path and, you know, oh, I'm going to go blow up this rock so I can get this heart piece, but then I'm going to move <laughs> along. Right. And so with with Tears of the Kingdom now, the the fact that you can kind of go anywhere and anything. And I, I actually think Tears of the Kingdom is a little bit more handholdy than Breath of the Wild was. Uh, it at it least probably is. I, I'll be honest with you, because they teach yeah. you more at the shrines and stuff. They do. They do a very good. They do it. But it's the right amount for me where. They te- mm-hmm. that you go to those those shrines are brilliant. Again, sell those folks at that studio are just some mm-hmm. of my insp- my personal in- inspiration as a game designer. So, to me, those shrines are brilliant because they're very short experiences. They're pretty easy. They feel rewarding to you. Not only do you get something that can increase your power, but you feel rewarded that you feel like you're smart because they're pretty easy to solve. I I think I've looked up one out of the thirty I've done, and. And they also unlock a fast travel point. So you're like double compelled to do them, right? Mm-hmm. And, and, and plus the way they show up in the environment, they pull you to different areas. So so like they just, I, there is no mistakes in that game, right? Like the, mm-hmm. everything is so thought through. Yeah. It's, it, 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 they, those games have always been love letters to games design for, to me. And this one in particular also, like just a love letter to great game design. It, it, we, it's amazing time to be a, like I, my, one of my jokes is like the geeks have won, like we've won, like mm-hmm. the, the nerds, the geek, whatever you want to call it. Like the, the things that we were, I, again, like I was in the seventies, D&D was not cool. Like <laughs> video games were definitely not cool. They were for a very little mm-hmm. bit of time when you would go to the arcade, but beyond, but after that they weren't. So, but yeah. now like we, like we've won, like it's, it's like, and to see this art form, this video game art form continue to grow and change and be mm-hmm. a part of that from any aspect as a, as a fan, as a creator, as, as, as a journalist is amazing. To me, it's just such a privilege, honestly, like it really is. Um, yeah. Because you, we like video games. Like I remember the debates when I started, my father was very upset that I left my good web design job to get into video games. He was very angry. Right. And then I was like, do you want me? like, and this is when video games have now like a hundred X what they were making. <laughs> like, yeah. And, like, everything so yeah. we that's bigger than movie releases and sports combined or music or something it's huge they're crazy yeah um, it's but anyway i just love it I, I love being a part of this whatever small part i've played and it. it's been a real real privilege well i i would say the part you played is not small uh, on <laughs> these games i i i know that you're 
you know, you seem like a humble guy, but I mean, I think Loran would agree with me that, that you played a major role in how, you know, I was, I was telling my wife again, I know she doesn't care, but she's the only person I talk to outside of, you know, these podcasts that will listen to me and put up with the things that I say. I'm like, I'm like, you don't understand who this guy is. He's, he's worked on these games that like pretty much any world that you explore that's big and open, he's had some sort of hand in. And like, these aren't just small games either. These are like, you know, award-winning giant RPGs. And I'm, I'm like, I'm like sitting there like being like stressed and anxious. I'm like, what am I going to say to this guy? I'm like, you know, this is, this is one of the coolest things that I've, you know, personally, I've ever been able to do. And, you know, Laurent sitting in, I'm sure, agrees. Uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, yeah, you shaped a lot. You shaped a lot of people's like gaming DNA. Like, you, you did. <laughs> believe me. Yeah. It's a true honor. I, uh, I am as big a fan of those games as everyone else. Uh, really? yeah. And, 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 and Weird Song, I hope, is, is the next big thing. Uh, because it, I, I think the setting sounds awesome. I think I always like the uh, alternate history aspects of things too, right? Yeah. Like, you know, not not really the same type of game at all, but like the Wolfenstein games are some of my favorite kind yeah. of alternate history. Oh, those and, games are amazing. <laughs> I know. Machine games yeah, is incredible. I like having fun with this stuff, um, making sure it's, in, like I said, it's inclusive. Everyone can come in and, and, and feel like they're, they, they have a, a role or a, a piece of this game. And in, in, I, Again, like I feel like it's again, like we're we are not reinventing the wheel. I, I didn't want to like like there's a lot of pitfalls you can hit when you're starting a new studio. And I'm already taking on a big game, which is something people warn you about. But what I wasn't gonna do is like I, I love like turn based tactical games, right? But I as a fan I'm a fan of these. I don't know how to make them, right? So I think mm-hmm. I know a lot about them. I play them endlessly, mm-hmm. but I wouldn't want to do that. So I, you know, and and, and um in, in this team we've assembled has have all built these games over and over again. Cause there's a special skill that comes to building these games because we don't have the massive resources. Some of these places do, you know, so we're going back to how we built these games early days with the smaller staff, reusing things, being smart, like focusing our, our effort on things that really matter and not on like, this t- these tiny little polish elements that make a cool experience, but they're, but ultimately they can also make it to me like a, like a shallow game. That makes mm-hmm. sense. Like yeah. want to go and have fun in, 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 in less emergent gameplay. Sometimes there's sometimes weird things happen. Right. But I think if people are having fun playing the games, they're not worried that a town's person walked into a wall or something, right? Like, because they're <laughs> having so much fun, mm-hmm. right. It's when, yeah. it's when they're not having fun, or it, or that suspension of disbelief is the term in writing in movies. Like if they're not, if their disbelief isn't suspended, that's when they start seeing the people walking in the walls and doing the other things. So, right. um, the number one goal of this game is to is to sort of like, it's for people to have fun. It's entertainment. The second goal is to show them an alternative history where, listen, like the the ultimate sub goal here is to make like to make it like a good movie or a book, like where you start to. There's aspects of your reality that I, I really believe in my personal life that you can affect. I, I There's this term called co-creating your reality, and I don't want to get too woo, but I really believe that a positive mental attitude and making the right decisions and being of service to people can really, really co-create your reality. Like, I don't believe I, I can levitate or something someday, but at the same time, like <laughs> there's opportunities that are the universe will provide to you if you are are open and willing to take them on right there's this old adage when the student is ready the teacher will appear and these are the kind of things that we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna push forward in this game and make sure people are having fun but also sort of experiencing this sort of um interesting uh the view of reality that some of us share <laughs> that's i i'm i'm really excited for this uh Laurent, do you have any any final questions or thoughts before we uh before we wrap uh, it up Oh, yeah. You've been too quiet, Laurent. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah. I, 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 kind of pre- I kind of preempted you, uh, Jeff, on this one. So I, sure. so I want to ask you, out of all the stuff that you've worked on, like now that you have your, now that you got your new studio and everything, out of all the stuff you've worked on, if there was one if there was one IP that you that you could just take with you, like it's like this is mine, it's coming with me, like which one would it have been? And in, in my gut instinct on that again is Skyrim. There was something magical about the development of that game. And and I, sorry to I, I 
I, I, I will, I will um, repeat my answer. We talked to when we um, were offline there for a minute. So there was something magical about working on that game. So I was the senior producer in charge of the design department. So I was real, I was in all the, the level design and systems design and narrative design, right? And Bethesda was interesting because they had designers who were responsible for the quests and story content and mm-hmm. level designers who built all the dungeons and towns and they became the jack of all trades. They had a lot of random encounters and that staff was very well run and over time took on more and more responsibilities. But there was an, honestly no system designers. There was no one designated as a system designer, which modern game creators' <laughs> heads are going to explode when they hear that. So what it was, was it was sort of like the... The, the strongest personality in the room, right? And there was a handful of, the, of both level and quest designers and me as like a, as, a, as an ostensible system designer. And so I did a lot of the combat, balancing, uh, creature skills, all that stuff. I actually physically did. Like, I, again, like I, I was a hands-on in the editor doing that. So when I, so that IP to me is so special because I look at it and I can see the influence I had on the game, not just from, Listen, a good producer is very important to a game because they keep things on track and they give people the time and space they need to be creative. Um, but uh, but having a, the to, to, being allowed to do that and also do some of the hands-on game design was is a magical time for me. And mm-hmm. I just Skyrim is still in the top most played games on Xbox. Like it, it's it's just it's just this game that. I mean, the, the joke and the meme is they, they keep re-releasing it, but people keep buying it and they damn well keep playing it. <laughs> they just yeah. released, they it's, just it's released another, the new another, version on Switch? Yeah. Like, <laughs> I'm going to have to get it. Wild. It's uh, wild. Um, but it's it's because of the, you know, it's because of the game itself and also modding. Modding is a big, big trick to those games. Like mm-hmm. people going in in... in so they're, and they're forever games. I think more game developers... So there's games as a service... And then there's there's like these linear games that either they're 20 hours or 100 hours or whatever, there's an end to them. And then there's these games that sort of like Skyrim who are still played and still exist. And I, I believe that Bethesda could still be releasing content for Skyrim, probably selling it, right? Yeah. And, and I think that that's the space that Weird Song is looking to fill. Like it is a, it's going to be a long game that we're going to continue to support for years and years to come. We're building it from the ground up to do this. And, um, and I have the team that's done it. And I am, like I said, I am, I was, I'm a very biased person, but I am in love with this game and I cannot wait to show everyone more. Just hey, you know, Hey, it's something, I, it's something I learned recently because uh, I've been trying to become more business minded because, um, I got, I recently got promoted at my job. Like, um, like I'm now like a managing partner, which means I have a small stake in the company now nice. and something, and something, and something I've, uh, something I just recently learned in the whole, in the whole sales process is the more excited and the more, and the more proud you are of, of your product, when you present it, the more, the more likely people are going to be, are going to latch onto it and, you know, want to have a piece of it as well and stuff like that. So, yeah, I find oh. myself apologizing sometimes in pictures because oh. I'm so excited. And one of my uh, business partner, he's like, if he, he's like, if you're not excited for it, no one else will be. So be as excited yeah, as you yeah, want to yeah. be. Yeah. But I get embarrassed, right? When you show that much emotion, but at the same time, like I, every day I wake up and I, and, and folks have taken the seed of this idea again, that Jessica, my wife and I can and, and we, we, came up with and they're executing on it at such a high level and then they bring their own take to it that's mm-hmm. what i mentioned i mentioned in one of the early interviews and i saw some i never read comments someone was like oh he's just making this up as he goes and i was like no i just i'm a creative person <laughs> and i and, and, and i like when somebody goes here's the vision but you figure out how you're going to execute on it what do you what do you bring right that's what gets me excited is when I when I'm taking on a creative project. And that's what I want to. Uh, that's the kind of excitement I want the folks working on it to have in every discipline, right? Everybody, everybody's a game designer. Everyone can comment on things. So our IT manager and our HR manager can comment on stuff. Like, listen, like you want to get opinions of people. It's it's a lot easier to hear stuff stinks internally than it is when it goes live. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because yeah. you actually yeah. can change something. Yeah. You can actually, you know. So in in in, I'm very big on constructive criticism. And, and you even have this term called constructive conflict, which means like, listen, like sometimes, yeah, they're going to be, they're going to be fights and I don't want, they're not obviously violent or, or even aggressive, mm-hmm. but there are two people can disagree and come to a common resolution uh, in, 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 in find either, either compromise or, or commit to the one or person, the other's idea. But I would much rather those things be said than silent resentment start. It's a big part of the studio. Like just say, say your piece, say your, speak your mind. Right. Mm-hmm. And, and at least 
and feel safe doing that. Feel safe to do that. So anyway, I, I absolutely in creating a studio has been just as exciting to me as creating a game, if that makes sense. It's really, really a fascinating, fun process. That is, it's difficult. It's hard. There's crying and there's terror sometimes, but it's it's very rewarding, right? You just you like it, it is a, it is a creation in and of itself, and it's it's really important to watch core values and treat your people well, and you know because that's how you make great games. Like people, you want people happy. <laughs> like yeah, unhappy yeah. people don't make good stuff. Like it's just right. I, I don't know what to say. Like I see it time and time again in many industries, not just games. Like, like so. I, th- I think it's cool too that you're building the game while you're building the studio too like in there grow together and you know when when weird song is this massive hit and everybody's talking about it right it, it it's gonna be tied to your studio forever you know yep. that's uh-huh. that's yeah. exciting so um one so two two more questions one kind sure. of serious and one kind of silly i guess uh so you said you're kind of building this as like a something you're planning on building upon. So would that be like, I mean, obviously super early, whatever, but uh, <clears throat> does that mean like, so you take Borderlands, for example, you're going to pack on expansions to it, or are you planning on like, here's like a Mass Effect style trilogy where like, you know, you have this world and you the your consequences may affect the next game or is or have you not even gotten that far yet? Cause you're so, I haven't gotten on. that far is the massive thing though. I love that they did that. Um, and you saw Zelda did that with horses. Like a lot of games yeah. have not, Witcher did that too. Like you can uh-huh. import decisions. I think that's, I think that's great. Um, so yeah, if we're lucky enough to make weird song too, then I would absolutely uh, take some of those decisions and, and bring them. And I think it'd be crazy not to the, the goal of the, listen, like when you, when you make a game, you got to look and you make a studio, you have to make sure you're, you know, you have work for everybody past the launch. Right. And so mm-hmm. part of this is, is part of the vision is to continue to support this game for as long as we can through both free and paid expansions. For sure. We plan on putting out stuff that we can, when we can, we'll put out stuff that we won't charge people for just because they're having fun, you know, patches, updates, new content as well. And then on a, on a cadence, we will t- decide on, can I'm getting way far ahead of myself. Some, <laughs> someone's going to read, play this interview back in my face someday. But, um, but the goal, again, these are the goals and the wishes and the, and the wish and the goal is, yeah, some of the content will be paid. Cause again, like, you know, we want, we need to, this, you know, all of us, you know, we have families and lives and things we need to support. Um, so yeah, there will be, uh, and we're going to come up with a cadence of release for this game. To keep it to keep it vibrant and alive, and we're building the game from the ground up to be extensible into the future. Um, that goes for the landmass, the character systems, the story. We're building the whole game with this idea that it's the beginning of the game, and we're going to continue to build on it. It's funny. I read a review of Di- or listened to a review of Di- no one reads anymore. I listened to a review of Diablo, and um, and they mentioned that the story felt like it was not finished. I was like, probably not, because I'm assuming they're looking at Diablo like it's a 10-year game, right. and they're going to continue to add on something. And I wish they did that to Diablo 3. So, yes, please, Blizzard, continue to do that. Like, I have no problem personally supporting games I love. Like, mm-hmm. like if I'm playing at hundreds of hours and I'm loving it, and they it's a reasonably priced expansion, of course I would pay for it. Like, I don't I don't know. Again, like, I'm buying yeah. it. But. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh. Are, I mean, have you decided what, what platforms you're aiming for? I mean, oh, is- we, we want this game uh, in its very early days. Like we still right. don't have a publishing partner yet. So, but our goal is all things being equal. My goal is to put it out on everything. All, all, all platforms. I want it in as many hands as possible because I, I feel like that's, that's great for gamers. It's great for us. And that's what we've, I've always, I, every product I've shipped has shipped on every platform since my first game. I shipped a GameCube game for God's sake. So there you go. <laughs> Two. I love, love, love my love my GameCube. Uh, all right, and then my uh, my our our one for our one friend who who listens, uh, Deshaun Malone, t- uh, messaged me. He DM'd me. He said, "Make sure you ask him how much cheese you can stuff in a building." I'm like, okay. <laughs> Because uh, one like, of my favorite quotes is from uh, Divinity Two, no, or one. Nobody, nobody has as many friends as the man with many cheeses. So yeah. there you go. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I said that at a party one night, and everyone looked at me like I had six heads. 
<laughs> oh man, this was uh, Jeff. This was this was an awesome. This was an awesome time. Yes. Thank you. For, yeah, I had a great you, time. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for taking the time out of your you know obviously busy schedule with this game in the studio and Diablo. Like this is <laughs> this is incredible. You wanna you wanna tell people where they can find you and more information on the game and sure sure so the best place so the best we have our websites www.somethingwickedgames.com it has a you know has about us some concept art that we have um some updates i do update it quarterly i promise um we just put an update about our team trip we went to uh santa fe new mexico and went to a place called meow wolf and some other really cool um native american sites which are, was was amazing um, and so something wicked games.com and then the Twitter handle for the studio is at some wicked games. I couldn't get something. So it's at some wicked games. My personal Twitter handles at JG 93. I was an early adopter. I got a four character Twitter handle. Nice. Um, and at weird song exists too, but we don't necessarily, we're not really updating that as much. So you can also go at weird song. We're also on YouTube, Facebook, LinkedIn. You can find us anywhere. Just search something wicked games. Yeah, I'll I'll put links in the show notes as well oh, great. To, to everything. So people can just one click it if they're listening or whatever. Uh Jeff Gardner, CEO of Something Wicked Games. Thank you so much for joining us. This was this was a blast. Uh you can find this episode and more on bossrush.net you can find all of our content there as well you'll be able to find this episode on podcast services on youtube and on our patreon one week early i want to thank everybody for watching and or listening until next time we love you goodbye so long the boss rush podcast is a product of boss rush media llc and is recorded from our headquarters in akron ohio this show is produced written and directed by me Corey Deering. My co-hosts are Stephanie Klimov, Laurent Dawkins, and Edward Barnell. You can find Stephanie at Klimov underscore author on Twitter and Instagram, as well as on the EXP cast. You can find Laurent at Exodus803 on Twitter, Instagram, Twitch, and YouTube, and also on Crossroads, the video game podcast. You can find Edward at that retro code on Twitter and Instagram, as well as hosting Nintendo Power. You can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at I am Corey and HD. You can find me hosting Tower Casuals, the Destiny Podcast, and co-hosting Nintendo Power. You can find the Boss Rush Podcast on all social media platforms at Boss Rush Podcast. You can also follow Boss Rush Media and the Boss Rush Network on all major social media. Join the Boss Rush Network Discord and Facebook groups to interact with other friends and fans. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time.